Hello everyone, I'm Sakshi. I'm a second year physiotherapy student and welcome back to Memonet. Today we'll be discussing on the zoology section, both section A and section B of part test 4. We have four part tests, so as we've approached to the last part test of this, of this series, now we'll be moving on to the full test. So as I mentioned in my earlier videos and I'm mentioning again, uh, in need, you need to have exact NCRT knowledge, but there may be a few, one or two questions that may require extra knowledge, knowledge right? We are focusing on those questions here as well. So in, in our part test, what we have done is that uh, we've always meant to focus on the NCRT questions as well as what we've done is that we've taken up questions which were there in the previous NCRTs but not in this NCRT or have been asked in need but are not direct NCRT based lines. So our part test, you will find a few questions here and there which have or which require more conceptual knowledge rather than exact NCRT lines. But that's what makes a good aspect, right? So let's begin. And uh, as we go to our full test, you will find that major portion of the full test is directly NCRT based because that's what we here are focusing on. And that's what will help you achieve a good thing. So without wasting any more time, uh, y'all can just drop any more doubts or any other thing that you want to discuss on our Telegram channel or on WhatsApp or in the YouTube comments below and we'll be sure to reply to that. So let's begin. Uh, starting with section A, zoology for part test 4. The first question states that, okay, the portion of this test for part test 4 is a uh, complete uh, class 12 syllabus. So let's go. Uh, given below are two statements. One is labeled as assertion and another is labeled as reasoning. So we return an assertion and reasoning type of question where there are two statements given. Let's see. The first is the testis is situated outside the abdominal cavity within a pouch called the scrotum. The reasoning is scrotum helps in maintaining the low temperature of the testis, which is necessary for spermatogenesis. What do you mean by spermatogenesis? It's the production of sperm. Okay. Now we need to choose the correct answer. Obviously, we know the testis is situated outside the body cavity, right? And why is it outside? Outside the abdominal cavity. Why is it outside the abdominal cavity? Because spermatogenesis needs a particular temperature. If it's inside the abnormal cavity, the temperature is a little higher where sperms cannot grow or sperms cannot thrive. So, the uh, scrotum is placed outside the abdominal cavity for a lower temperature as mentioned here. Hence, the correct answer is both assertion and reasoning are true and reasoning is the correct explanation for the assertion. Moving to question number 152. Okay. Now, here we have basically the correct order of fetal development. So, instead of just matching it, I'll just read out the correct explanation to make it easier for all. And that's how we find a way to remember it. Okay. So, answer number three is the correct explanation. It's this option. You all can just check if you all have got that correct or not. And now we'll discuss about it. So, in the first month, what forms is the heart? Because anything, everything you need to have your heart in it, right? So, the first month, what forms is the heart? The second month is the limbs and the digits. The third month, towards the end of the third month, is all the major organ systems are formed. In the fifth month, so we are not talking about the fourth month because the major organ systems take a little more time to form, is what we are considering here. So towards the third month and then considering till the fourth year, major organ systems are formed. In the fifth month, movement of the fetus begins. And by the sixth month, obviously now the fetus is moving, right? So it needs to see or know what's happening, right? So the eyelids will separate, right? So first we have the heart, then we have the limbs and the digits. Then towards the third month end, we have major organ systems throughout the fourth also. For the fifth month, we have movement of the fetus and in the sixth month, we have the eyelids separated. Okay. So if we see it's A5, B4, C3, B2 and E1. Moving to the next question, which is question number 153. Okay. So, seminal plasma, which is rich in fructose, calcium, and enzymes, is a product of what? The answer is all of these because it's seminal plasma, right? So, seminal plasma is basically a constituency of all of the secretions of the male accessory gland. So, the male accessory glands include what? Seminal vesicles, prostate, and cowper's gland. Cowper's gland is also known as what? Bulbohyrethroid gland. 
So the secretions of all of these three glands constitute seminal plasma, which is rich in pros, uh, which is rich in, I'm so sorry, fructose, calcium, and enzymes. And all of these and uh, all of these secretions have functions individually in seminal plasma to get uh, and in the seminal plasma they also perform certain functions. Okay, so I've got this diagram from Google where you can see the mammary gland. So what we can see here is the mammary lobule. Okay, so several, just a second, let me just on the oh. One second. Okay, so what you can see here is the mammary lobule, right? Now after the mammary lobule, they are joining to form secondary mammary tubules, right? Now, these mammary tubules form to give us the mammary duct. The mammary duct then gives us the ampulla and then the lactiferous duct. Okay. So, what the question stated was uh, several mammary ducts are connected to the lactiferous duct via what? So, we can see that the connection between a mammary duct and a lactiferous duct is via an ampulla. And this part is known as the ampulla. This is a lactiferous duct. Then this area is known as the nipple from where the milk will come out. Okay. So let me just close this now. Just a second. Okay, so let's move on to the next question where it is a function of male accessory ducts and glands are maintained by what? So the function of male accessory ducts and glands. I already mentioned the male accessory glands, which are known as, I just said three names. Do you all remember? Seminal vesicle, prostate and cowper. Cowper is also known as the bulbaritary gland. Yes. So the function of these accessory glands and their ducts are maintained by androgens, which are known as testicular hormones or male hormones. Okay, next we go to 156. Where it is in a female child at birth, oocyte is in the stage of what? Okay. So we know that oogenesis begins uh, in like in the embryological phase itself, right? So when after birth, what happens is that uh, oogenesis is already begin in, in uh, when it was an embryo, right? So now in a female child at birth, oocytes, oocytes will be in a stage of prophase one of the first meiotic division. Okay. After which at puberty, the phases will change. Then it will go on a maturation and then it will be released. Next question, 157. Uh, we have to match. Okay, so what is testis? Testis, is it a tiny finger-like structure of testis? No. Is it funnel-shaped? Is it oval in shape? Or it is finger-like projection appearing on the trophoblast? Or it's the edges of the infundibulum? Let's see. So the answer is option number three, which is testis are oval in shape. Okay. Then what is an infundibulum? In fundibulum is obviously from the name we can collect in fundibulum. So it's a funnel shaped structure. So in fundibulum is funnel shape. Then we have fimbria. We can relate to fimbria as fingers. So fimbria are what? Finger like rejections at the edges of the in fundibulum. Okay. So we have a funnel. At the edge, we have finger like rejection. So it's a funnel shaped structure with finger like rejection. So in fundibulum and fimbria. Then there's clitoris. Clitoris stands for what? It is a tiny finger like structure. Now, we do not need to get confused between finger-like projections and finger-like structure. This is a finger-like structure. These are finger-like projections. And we have chorionic villi, which are again finger-like projections, but they appear where? On the trophoblast. So, what needs to be remembered is that fimbrae are finger-like projections. Chorionic villi are also finger-like projections, but chorionic villi appear on the trophoblast. Fimbrae appear on the infundibulum, which is a funnel-shaped structure. And the clitoris is a finger-like structure. Okay. Next, we go to...
Okay, so moving on to the 158th question. It's an assertion and reasoning type of question again, where they state that assertion is in India, IUDs like copper tea is one of the most widely accepted method of contraception. And the reasoning is that it can be self-inserted by the user. So what is correct and what is wrong? So basically the answer is option number two, which is A is true, but R is false. So let's see, in India, IUDs like copper tea is one of the most widely accepted method. We need to remember this for contraception. And these devices are not inserted by ourselves. Condoms are a method of contraception which can be used by the user themselves. But these devices are inserted by doctors and expert nurses. So moving on to the next question. Okay, so for the next question, which is question number 159, they are saying the pathogens responsible for causing elephant diastasis are transmitted to a healthy person through what mode of, what is the mode of transmission basically for elephant diastasis? So the answer is option number two, that is my female mosquito vectors. So let's say elephant diastasis is also known as lymphatic filariasis. So let's see, it affects the lymphatic system basically. Okay, so elephant diastasis is also known as filariasis. It is transmitted how through parasitic worms by the bite of female infected mosquito. Okay, generally belong to the genera Culex, Anopheles and Aedes. So all of these mosquitoes, when they bite you, female mosquitoes, they who are already infected, they may cause elephant diastasis. In elephant acid, basically what happens is that the, the limb becomes swollen due to lymphatic edema and like infection of the lymphatic system. Next is question number 160, which is the following drugs act by interfering with the transport of neurotransmitter dopamine. Okay, so answer number is three, that is cocaine. So whenever a person has cocaine as a drug, what happens is that it affects the dopamine in your brain. Neurotransmitter dopamine is effective. So let's read the explanation. Cocaine is a powerful stimulant drug that act by blocking the uptake of neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. However, its most prominent effect is on dopamine. So all these three neurotransmitters will be affected. That is dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. But what is most affected is dopamine. So now dopamine helps in involvement in movement, emotion, motivation, and pleasure. So all of these functions are affected because of having cocaine. Next, a cook. Carrier of a disease and spread the disease for many years by the food she prepared. Do you remember the story? Do you think the story is like something that you heard of earlier? This information is associated with a classic case on medicine. That of, okay. So as we know, when it's related to cooking and when it's a disease, we all can think of is typhoid. So when we typhoid, ki baat karte hai, to basically typhoid kis se spread hua tha? It's by Mary Mellon, right? Mary Mellon. Now, was she named Typhoid Mary or was her real name Typhoid Mary? So, obviously, kisi ka naam Typhoid to nahi hoga. So, Mary Mellon, nicknamed as Typhoid Mary, is the correct answer. So, let's see, 161, the answer is 1. Now, she did not know this because she was watching with an asymptomatic carrier of Salmonella typhi, which is the causative organism for Typhoid. And as she was a cook, she was cooking, cooking, and through that, she spread Salmonella typhi to so many people. So, yeah, so we should know that asymp if even if a person is an asymptomatic carrier, he can spread infections as easily as someone who's symptomatic. So, at all times, we need to be aware of the food we are eating, the water we are drinking, and the people we are coming in contact with. Next, 162, given below two statements, statement A and uh, statement 1 and statement 2. Okay, when an infected female anopheles mosquito bites, it releases gametocytes of plasmodium into the healthy person. Is this true? No. So what happens is that when an infected female mosquito, anopheles mosquito bites, it releases gametophytes of plasmodium into an healthy individual. No, that doesn't happen. What does it release? It injects sporozoites of plasmodium. So like when you're reading this during the neat paper, if this question appears and you're reading this, you'll easily skip through the word gametocytes because we are in such a hurry while solving this and then you'll mark the wrong circle and then four, five marks will be deducted. It's a long cycle. So what you need to remember is when a bite is taking place, sporozoites are released and not gametocytes. And statement 2 says that female anopheles mosquito takes up the sporozoites. Obviously, I just told you that they release sporozoites, right? So what happens? Uh, what do they take up? They take up gametocytes. So release sporozoites, take up gametocytes. You can remember it as release. The word has an S. So it releases sporozoites. Gametocytes are taken up. So that is uh, taken up as gametocytes. Okay. So for this, both of the statements were incorrect. So it's statement one and two are both incorrect. It's answer number four. Moving to 163. Okay. This is a diagram. As we can see here. 
So it's the diagram for the Urey and Miller experiment, which was conducted by, it's basically a stage in evolution. So it was conducted to stimulate conditions that were present to be on early Earth to understand the origin of life. So now we don't know how humans came in, came in picture on Earth, right? So all we need to do is we need to stimulate the conditions that were present on early Earth to see what was the first form of life that originated. So in their apparatus, what they did, they created an environment which is similar to that of primitive Earth. Okay, and then there were various gases present. What were the gases present? So it's basically methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water vapor. Okay, so let's see what the question asked here is. The question asked here is, okay, uh, we need to show the gases G contained in the flask. Here, basically. So what were the gases? I already told you all. It was ammonia. It was water vapor. It was methane. And another thing, if you all remember, it was hydrogen. Okay. So now let's go to the match the following, which is 164. Okay. Now this is a difficult question. Difficult as in, you all need to remember it. It's basically a direct line. So let's see. Homologous is divergent evolution. Parallelogous is gene replication. Analogous is convergent evolution. And orthologous is speciation. Now I'll discuss each of these terms in detail, but these are the answers. So you all can remember it. Let me give you all a trick to remember this. Homologous is divergent evolution. So HD. HD may dekhna hai tumko screen, right? Everyone loves HD. So homologous is divergent evolution. Analogous is convergent evolution. So AC. So AC, HD. AC is analogous. Analogous is convergent evolution. HD is homologous, which is divergent evolution. Paralogous is PG, which is paralogous is gene replication. Okay. So we have AC, HD, PG. AC, analogous convergent evolution. HD, which is homologous divergent evolution. PG, paralogous, which is gene replication. Okay. So now let me explain each of these terms in detail. Okay, so as I discussed earlier, we remembered the short form as HD, which is homologous divergent. So in homologous, another thing that we need to know is that for homologous structures, they have different functions, but they're structurally same. For analogous structures, which is AC, which is analogous and convergent evolution, they have the same functions, but are anatomically different. Okay, so now next question. Darwin, in his natural selection theory, did not believe in any role of which one of the following in organic evolution? The answer is one. So discontinuous variations was not considered by Darwin. So let us read the explanation. Darwin's theory of natural selection did not specifically deny the existence of discontinuous variations. However, he primarily focused on continuous variations. So yeah, he did not consider discontinuous variation. Next question. 166. In Hardy Weinberg equation, the frequency of heterozygous individuals is represented as what? Okay, the equation is do you know the equation a plus b the whole square gives a square plus 2ab plus b square? It's the same thing. So we have p square plus 2p cube plus q square, which equals to 1. So here p is the frequency of one allele in the population. Q represents the frequency of other allele in the population. p square will be what? Now, if we have p and p, that makes it p square. So it represents the and both p's are same, right? So it's homozygous. So it p square represents the frequency of homozygous dominant individuals. Q square represents the frequency of homozygous recessive individuals. And 2PQ represents the frequency of heterozygous individuals because it's 1P and 1Q, two different alleles. So it's heterozygous individuals. So they've asked us frequency of heterozygous individual is represented by, so we have 2PQ. For 167th question, okay. Now this is our direct NCRT statement. Uh, like it's not a statement, but it's obviously based on context from the NCRT. So from early to most recent, which is the order. So this is the order. Let's just learn this order once and for all. Okay. So the short form that I had made during my need this one, this is RAHH, which is Ramapithecus, Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. Okay. So let's just see the explanation as they've mentioned here. So Rama, as we know, like in India, everyone, like Ram. Okay. So Ram, Bhagwan Ram has... We can consider it to be the oldest to begin with. So we begin with Ramapithecus, Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. So R A H H. Ramapithecus, Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. Next question, 168, which is okay. So now we have bacteria and fungus. We have to match. Okay. So 
they have said that answer is option one, which is A2. So bacteria are lysosomes. What does that mean? So first is bacteria, lysosome. Then we have fungus, which is chitinous. Then we have cotton wall worm and we have corn borer. Cotton wall worm matches with cry 2AB. So this, how I used to remember this is that, see, cotton ball worm. Ball worm has two L's. Okay, just let me, one second. Ball worm has two L's here. Cry 2AB also has two N looking structures here because this is difficult to remember and there is no concept. So certain times you have to work smart instead of working harder. So if you see cotton ball worm, which has two L's, cry 2AB also has two L's. Hence, we can say that cotton ball worm matches with cry 2AB. So, corn borer matches with what? Cry 1AB. Okay. So, now let's read the, read the explanation that's been provided here. So, in order to cut the DNA with restriction enzyme, it needs to be in pure form. Okay. That is free from any other macromolecules. Since DNA is within the membrane, so first we have to break open that. Okay. So now we need to break open. So we'll need to cut off what, what proteins, polysaccharides and also lipids. So this can be treated by treating the bacterial cell or plants with an enzyme that is lysozyme, which kills bacteria, cellulase and chitinous. Okay. So when you want to free anything, so we have chitinous. So that helps remove fungus. Lysozyme, which helps remove bacteria. So here, what you all did not notice is that here we've written it as lysosome. This is wrong. It should be mentioned as lysozyme. Okay. So lysozyme helps to get rid of bacteria. For, uh, chitinous helps to get rid of fungus. Cotton ball worm, since it has two L, look at L structures. I2 AB also has two L. If we remember in that way. So this is the correct answer. Okay. So moving to question number 169. The answer with this question is option number three. That is international inactivation of beta calcitis leads to blue color columns. This statement is incorrect because it leads to uh, it leads to colorless colonies. So the answer for this means what? So in this, a recombinant DNA is inserted within the coding sequence of the enzyme that is beta galactosidase. This results into inactivation of the gene. So there's a gene in which we introduced an other thing, right? So it leads to insertion inactivation of the gene for the synthesis of this enzyme, which is called as insertional inactivation. This presence of a chromogenic chromogenic substance gives blue color colonies. If the bacteria does not have an insert, but if there is an insert, then it's inactivated. So there's insertional inactivation, which leads to colorless colonies. So does it lead to blue color colonies? No, that's an incorrect answer. Now moving to question number 170, we have in palindromic sequence of endonuclease, the palindromic sequence of endonuclease is what? So the answer is number two. Basically palindrome, we know what that is. It is the same from front and back. Okay, so I had said M-A-M -M or M-O-M. So it's MAM front, MAM to the back. So that is the, uh, the second option, which is the sequence is read the same when read on two strands in the same polarity. When orientation of reading is kept the same. True. Next. In eco R1, what is co? So we need to know that. <clears throat> One second. Yeah. Eco R1 comes from Escherichia coli R by 13. In eco R1, the letter R is derived from the name of the strain. Okay, so what is co? Co is nothing. It is just E. coli. So it doesn't mean anything. Though. Okay, so for question number 172, they've asked us which one of the following is not considered as the useful selectable marker in E. coli. So what are selectable markers that are useful to us? We need to know the names. So it's tetracycline, chloramphenicol, ampicillin, canamycin. Right, they are selectable markers which are useful. But here, is it tetracycline or is it tetracyclone? It's tetracyclone. So this is what we need to be aware of. It's the teeniest mistake that could be possible, but that could make a huge difference in marks and in your rank. So it's tetracyclone. So the, in, so the statement that we'll choose as a correct answer is option number three. Here the answer is written wrong. So please make corrections. We are so sorry for the typing mistake. So it's answer number three. DNA dependent DNA polymerase used in PCR extraction extracted from Two, which is Thermus aquaticus. DNA dependent DNA polymerase are used in PCR extracted from Thermus aquaticus. Moving to the next question. The correct order of steps in polymerase chain reaction is, we've learned this earlier also, right guys? It's DAE, D -A -E, which is denaturation, annealing and extension. So let's see. Denaturation, annealing and extension. PCR, DAE. Next. 
restriction enzymes are what? So let's see. Everyone knows what restriction enzymes are, right? That's why you all are where you all are here at this point because it's a very easy question. So the answer is one, which is are endonucleases which cleave DNA at specific sites? Are they exonucleases or endonucleases? They are endonucleases. What do they do? They cleave, that is, cut the DNA at specific sites. Okay, so moving on to question number 177. We have insect resistant transgenic cotton has been produced by inserting a piece of DNA from what? So the answer is two from a bacterium, which is Bacillus thuringiensis. Hence, it is also known as cotton, it is also known as Bt cotton, which is Bacillus thuringiensis cotton because the transgenic piece has been, because the transgenic cotton, that is Bt cotton, has been produced by inserting a piece of Bacillus thuringiensis. Next, 178. Which of the, sorry, which of the following is or are correct about adenosine diaminase deficiency? Let's see the answer. The answer is option number four, which is all the four are correct. So let's read. In the absence of ADF, purine metabolism is disturbed and T lymphocytes fail to function. That's correct. Area deficiency is caused by deletion of the gene for ADA. Obviously, true. In some cases, it can be cured by bone marrow transplant. That is a replacement therapy. Yes, that's true. But obviously, it's not completely cured. But yes. Then the fourth option is for permanent cure. Genes isolated from the bone marrow cells producing ADA at early embryonic stages can be a possible cure. Yes. So all the four are true. Bacillus thuringiensis is used to control what? So the answer for this is answer number one, which is insectal pests. Insect pests. Some strains of Bacillus thuringiensis produces proteins that kill some insects like Leptoterans, Coleopterans and Dipterans. All of these are killed by using Bacillus thuringiensis. Next, the aim and objective of Genetic Engineering Approval Committee, that is GEAC, is what? It's the fourth option. Answer is 4, which is 1, 2, and 3. All of the following are aims. So first aim is to permit the use of genetically modified organisms for commercial purposes, to adopt procedures for restriction and production and application of genetically modified organisms, and approval to conduct large-scale field trials and release of transgenic crops in the environment. Okay. Moving to the next question. 181 question. That is RNAi. Stands for RNA interferon. RNA inactivation. No, it stands for RNA interference. Interference is basically to bother or to hinder something, right? So, RNA is used in the example. Perfect example for RNA interference mentioned is infestation by Melodigine incognita that infects the roots of tobacco. Next is 182. The most important component of oral contraceptive pills is what? Let's see. The most important component of oral contraceptive pills is progesterone estrogen because they are estrogen progesterone com combination. Then, just one eighty third question, which is in barrier method, ovaries sperms are prevented from physically meeting. Is that true? Yes, that's true. Then, for barrier methods, are used during coitus to prevent the entry of ejaculated semen into the female reproductive tract. Is that true? Let's read. So basically, the barriers, condoms are uh, barriers that are used to cover the penis in the male or the vaginal cervix in the female just before coitus. So what happens is that the ejaculated semen would not enter into the female. So what we know, need to know is that what basically happens in the barrier method is that a condom is used either by the male or by the female and physical meeting of the uh, sperms and the ovum is not possible because when males use the condom or females use them, the ejaculated semen entry is prevented into the female reproductive tract. Therefore, the answer for this is uh, assertion and reason are both correct and the reason is the correct explanation for the assertion. Let's change this. Let me just make a note of it so that oh, there are no other discrepancies as such to y'all. Next is 184. Given below are four methods, A to D and 1 to 4. Okay, let's see. We need to match the correct options. So basically, oh, okay. So the answer is option number 3, which is 1 C. So, the pill prevents what? Prevents ovulation, right? Does it pill, if you eat the pill, will it prevent the sperms from reaching the cervix? No, the sperms are going to reach the cervix. Will it prevent implantation? Maybe. But how? Because it doesn't, because it prevents ovulation itself. So, there's no case that can, that there can be an implantation. So, the pill will prevent ovulation. Condoms do what? Condoms prevent the sperms from reaching the cervix, right? Yes. Vasectomy. What does that do? The semen will contain no sperms because the vast difference are tight, cut and tight. And what does copper tea do? It prevents implantation. 
185, which one of the following can be used to cure infertility in couples with a male partner has a very low sperm count? So the answer is three, which is intrauterine insemination. Okay, so moving on to question number 187. Echo R1 cuts the DNA between bases. Which bases does it cut? So the answer is option number four. That is, Echo R1 cuts the DNA between the bases G and A. Only when the sequence GAA TTC is pressed. So it's a six base pair sequence we know. So it's GAA TTC. And the cut is made between G and A. Next question is 188. Which of the following is not a desirable feature for a cloning vector? So presence of two or more recognition sites. Yes, it should have only one recognition site where it can cut. As having two or more options in life is confusing, right? So in order to link the DNA alien, uh, alien DNA, the vector needs to have very few, preferably only one recognition site for the commonly used restriction enzymes. That's the correct option. For 189, biolistic, that is gene gun, is used for what? The answer is option number two. That is, it is used for transformation of plant cells. Okay, so suitable for plant cells as what happens in suppose it's a plant cell and have a gene gun. That is a biolistic method. Okay, so the gene plant cells are bombarded with a high velocity of microparticles of gold or tungsten, which are coated with DNA. So I have a gold or tungsten particle coated with DNA, put into the gun. Then the gun is fired at high velocity and high velocity microparticles are released that are bombarded on the plant. Next question, 190. When a quick immune response is required, we administer which kind of immunization? Okay, so basically we have active immunization and passive immunization. When we want a quick immunization, so a quick immune response, the passive immunization is preferred. That is what happens in that case. Preformed antibodies are introduced into, for immediate protection against the pathogen. If you want a slow response, then we'll use active immunization because active immunization lasts longer. Okay. And for passive immunization, the antibodies that are inserted are weakened and they come from a variety of sources, like either from humans themselves, from animal donors, or from other lab procedures. Question number 191. So 191, it says that, uh, yeah, yellowish fluid, that is colostrum, secreted by the mammary gland of the mother during the initial days of lactation, has abundant IgA to protect the infant. This type of immunity is called what? Okay, so its answer is answer number one. That is, it is transferred from what to what? It's transferred from the mother to the fetus. Did the fetus gain that immunity by itself? No, it was transferred. So it is known as passive immunity. Also, if we go to see, a passive immunity can also be naturally acquired or artificially acquired, right? If you are given any vaccination, it's an artificially acquired passive immunity. But here it's transferred from the mother which is the most natural source, right? So, it's called naturally acquired passive immunity. Next question. Okay. Select the correct option to complete the analogy. Dengue is by dengue or dengue is by Aedes mosquitoes. Chicken gunya is by what? Chicken gunya is caused by, let me just see, it's also by Aedes mosquito. Therefore, just as dengue is associated with Aedes mosquito, chicken gunya is also transferred with the same vector. So, this is an analogy-based question. Then 193, industrial melanism as observed in peppered moth proves that, the answer is one, that the true black melanic forms arise by recurring random mutation. So, basically, what was industrial melanism? Industrial melanism refers to the phenomena observed in some species. Pepper moth is one example where the darker melanic form became more prevalent in industrial areas with higher level of pollution. So basically, if I have a room, okay, there's a lot of pollution in that area. Okay, I mean, in an area, if there's a lot of pollution and there are moths, okay, that is what happened in industrial melanism. So there was basically an area where there was a lot of pollution. So all the bark of the trees were turning black. Everything was just turning darker and darker in color. Okay, so now the peppered moths, they needed to camouflage to protect themselves, right, to be eaten by other predators. So what they did, they also turned darker so that they could camouflage on the bark of the trees. Now, this dark coloration helped them to camouflage against darker backgrounds, resulting in higher survival rates. So, for survival, they tried to be the fittest of themselves. That is, the survival of fittest came into picture. So, true black melanic form arise by random recurrent mutations. Okay. And the lighter moths transform to darker moths. Now, 194. A population of species invades a new area, which from the following will lead to adaptive radiation. So, answer is three. That is area with many types of vacant habitats. So, basically, in an area with many types of vacant habitats, there are multiple ecological niches. 
available for exploitation. This creates opportunities for different people of different populations, invading species to adapt to different environmental conditions, leading to divergence of fates, therefore leading to adaptive radiations. So whenever there's a vacant, lot of vacant habitat, it leads to adaptive radiation. For question number 195, which one of the following is the most widely accepted method of contraception in India at present? Do you all know? I just discussed this. So the most widely accepted method is IUD, that is intrauterine devices. 196, uh, we are approaching towards the end of this test, guys. So have your full focus here. Last four questions to go. 196, signals from fully developed fetus and placenta ultimately lead to parturition, which requires the release of what? Okay. So let me open the answer for this. Yeah. So the answer is option number two, which is oxytocin from the maternal pituitary. What happens? See, parturition is the process when the baby is expelled out. Okay. So process of parturition is induced by both the nervous system and the hormones of the mother. The signals for childbirth originally uh, uh, are received from fetus and the placenta. Discovery what is Mild uterine contractions and fetal ejection reflex. This causes release of oxytocin from the mother. And prolactin hormone is also coming into picture. So basically, we want oxytocin ka release from mother ka pituitary gland for contraction of the uterus. Okay. Several hormones like HCG, HPL, that is human chorionic gonadotropin and human prolactin. Estrogen, progesterone are all produced by what? So answer is option number two, that is placenta. So the placenta is a temporary organ. Obviously, now if I've grown, I don't have a placenta, right? So, placenta is a temporary organ that helps in the exchange of gases, nutrients, and waste materials between the mother and the fetus. And it also acts as a temporary endocrine gland. For question number 198, about which day in a normal human menstrual cycle does rapid secretion of LH, that is known as LH surge, occur? So, we know on the 14th day what occurs at ovulation, right? So, in human females, ovulation is the release of secondary oocyte. From the ovary and about 14th day. At this 14th day, whenever there's ovulation, both LH and FSH attain a peak level. So, rapid secretion of LH induces rupturing of the fully developed graphene follicle and release of ovum. So, LH surge is the cause for ovulation to occur. So, if they ask you ovulation occurs on what day, it's the 14th day. If they ask LH surge occurs, occurs on what day, it's also the 14th day. Why? Because LH surge only is the cause for ovulation. Moving to question number 198. About oh, sorry, question number 199. Which of the following is a correct statement? IUDs once inserted need not to be replaced. Next, IUDs are generally inserted by the user herself. This is wrong because it's inserted by medical practitioners. IUDs increase phagocytosis is form in the uterus. Yes, yes, that is correct. And IUDs suppress gametogenesis. No, that is wrong. And do they not need to be replaced? They need to be replaced, but after long intervals of time. So what is correct? The correct statement is that IUDs in IUDs increase phagocytosis of sperm in the uterus. Last question. The permissible use of technique of amniocentesis is for what is amniocentesis? Basically, this amniotic fluid which surrounds the fetus inside the uterus. Okay. Uh, so now we take a sample of that amniotic fluid through the abdominal wall and then under ultrasound guidance this is performed and then when that sample is tested it can tell us uh, various abnormalities it can tell us chromosome chromosomal patterns due to which using the chromosomal patterns we can also detect the sex of the unborn fetus right but artificial insemination is the wrong option because that has nothing to do here artificial uh, it is a method for achieving fertilization for achieving for conceiving basically so amniocentesis is a method of testing so that's wrong and transfer of embryo into the uterus of the surrogate mother this method is also not related to amniocentesis at all so we can have two options detecting of sex of the unborn fetus can occur using amniocentesis and detecting any genetic abnormalities can occur using amniocentesis but they've asked what is the permissible use so the permissible use of the technique of amniocentesis is for detecting any genetic abnormalities in India, detecting the sex of the unborn fetus is not allowed earlier because uh, there are various practices that have occurred and are and still occur in the rural parts of India where if the sex of the child is a female, then the female child is killed because girl, child are, girl children are not appreciated, are considered to be a bane rather than a boon. So detecting sex of the unborn fetus is not a permissible use of amniocentesis. 
but detecting any genetic abnormalities such as spina bifida or any metabolic errors can be a boon. Okay, so we've finished discussing the zoology section. Uh, while seeing the video, you all must have noticed that I've left out two questions. That is question number 176. Just a second. This question and question number 186, which is this question. So here, uh, there has been a certain mistake while framing the question. And due to some technical mistakes, the question framed here is wrong. So I'll be displaying the correct question on my screen here and we can discuss them. So that you're at least aware of the question if it appears in the NEET exam, because the question once seen is a, is a new concept once learned. So let's begin. Okay, so in case of question number 176, this is the correct question and it's a little bit difficult. So let's see. Tetanus. Uh, also, in just the options mark, all the other options have not been stated because let's just focus on the correct concept for now. So the answer for A is 3, which is tetanus. How is tetanus formed? It is by preformed antibodies, also known as antitoxin, because whatever goes into our body that's bad is a toxin. So to kill that, that is tetanus when inserted, acts as an antitoxin. Okay, so there are preformed antibodies. For hepatitis B, it is recombinant DNA vaccine. So if they ask an example of a recombinant DNA vaccine is, so that's hepatitis B. Then C, that is colostrum. Colostrum has IgA antibody. Okay, that is immunoglobin A antibodies. That is present in the breast milk. And then it's influenza. Influenza, the answer is two, which has live attenuated viruses, uh, a live attenuated vaccine. Why is it attenuated and what is live? So live is basically that the uh, organism that is used in the vaccine has not been killed. It has just been attenuated, which means it has just been weakened. So for influenza, we need live attenuated vaccines. Hepatitis B is a recombinant DNA vaccine. For tetanus, we need preformed antitoxins or antibodies. And colostrum has IgA antibodies. And this is a question in place of 186 question. So let's see. Uh, for this is for recognition sites on PBR322 of E. coli and the role of these vectors. So let's see the site. First is ampicillin resistance and tetracillin resistance site. So that is three, which is an antibiotic resistant gene. Obviously, we all know this. Next is BAM H1. BAM H1 is what? It is a foreign DNA ligation site. So whenever any ligation is to occur, it takes place at the BAM H1 site. ORI, the or origin of replication. What is ORI stand for? Origin of replication. Okay. So ORI, that is origin of replication site. That is answer number C stands with two. And ROP. That is, uh, the answer is plasmid replication protein. Okay. So, so I'm sorry for any of the confusion that has been caused in this paper. And uh, also, I give all of my best wishes. And uh, please keep practicing, keep revising the NCRT. Keep watching this video solution so we come up with new questions each time. Because just going through the answer paper is not going to do you any good. It will, but only to a certain extent. Because everyone goes to answer papers. But the efforts that your teachers, your mentors put into framing questions may sometimes have some difficulties which can be solved only by them. So please have interactions and uh, continue doing your best and God is seeing the rest. Thank you. All the best. And all these solutions for the physics, chemistry and the botany section have been put up. So please go and check them out. If there are any comments, Anything that you all would like us to change, anything that any of your valuable feedbacks will help us improve in a better way for you all. So please continue using Memony. Please continue to be with us and uh, we'll help you achieve a great score. Okay. Thank you so much. All the best. And do remember to take part in our full test series, which are coming up and revise your NCRT at your tips.